When was the last time you felt like this is the best moment of my life? <coughs> Recall that memory. How are memories made and what are they? Gabriel Kremen, Harvard Lab, is building models to understand memory formation with a focus on neural circuit computation and biologically inspired artificial intelligence. He is a professor at Harvard Medical School, faculty at Children's Hospital and Thrust Leader in the Harvard MIT Center for Brains, Minds, and Machines. Please welcome to the stage, Gabriel Kremen. Thank you very much. I'm very privileged uh, to be here and learning from all of you. Uh, I am very sorry to disappoint and break this uh, extraordinary line of uh, succession of talks from Stanford. I'm not at Stanford. Um, so uh, I, I want to talk about uh, what I think is the most exciting and most uh, challenging problem of uh, all times, that is uh, understanding the brain. The brain is the most complex system that was ever tackled uh, by, uh, by science. Uh, those physicists that developed quantum mechanics or got us to the moon in the last century, those guys had it easy. Uh, the, the brain is really the, 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 the real challenge. And, and if we can stand up to this challenge and understand brain function, this will have profound implications in almost every aspect of our lives. Uh, it will have uh, implications for, for politics. It will probably change our, uh, our legal system. Uh, and of course, uh, uh, it will help us uh, uh, fix brains, as we have been discussing uh, all along yesterday and, and, and today, uh, and also build uh, smarter machines that further develop uh, the, the burgeoning field of uh, artificial intelligence. At the intersection of uh, AI, and uh, medicine and science uh, lies uh, the enormous opportunity to build brain-machine interfaces, uh, uh, devices that can uh, help us uh, go directly into the brain uh, and potentially uh, uh, help alleviate disorders, uh, but also maybe one day uh, augment uh, uh, human uh, cognition. Brain-machine interfaces have been particularly successful in the domain of uh, motor prosthesis. We have devices that can help paraplegic patients, for example, or in the sensory domain, for example, in the context of uh, cochlear implants. But uh, the field of uh, brain-machine interfaces for high-level cognition, for memory, for emotions, for, for, for vision, and for many other domains, it's still in its uh, infancy. We have a rather unique opportunity to begin to uh, evaluate aspects of brain-machine interfaces by virtue of working with neurosurgeons who implant electrodes uh, uh, in the human brain. Uh, this is uh, typically done in cases of patients who have uh, pharmacologically resilient uh, uh, epilepsy, and neurosurgeons implant uh, little electrodes like the ones that you're seeing uh, uh, there in different parts of the brain in order to localize and pinpoint precisely where the seizures are coming from, and also to map uh, function. The patients stay in the hospital for about one week, and during this one week, uh, we have uh, the opportunity to really peek inside the human brain uh, uh, with very high signal-to-noise ratio, uh, a temporal precision of milliseconds, and, and a very high spatial resolution, sometimes even at the level of uh, individual neurons. So let me give you an example of what happens inside the human uh, brain. So this is a patient uh, uh, that has a, an electrode in the inferior temporal cortex. Uh, one of our students in the lab is flashing pictures, so we're showing pictures of faces and fruits and chairs and animals and so on. Uh, and what you're seeing here is the intracranial field potential, the IFP as a function of time, uh, showing selectivity for some of these different cat categories of uh, different visual stimuli. Uh, on the right here, you're seeing every single individual trial. So looking at individual trials is critical for brain-machine interfaces. Even in individual trials, about 100 milliseconds after the onset of the picture, we get a signal that's uh, highly selective, invariant to visual transformations, and allows us to decode what the patient is, in this case, seeing, or in some cases, even uh, uh, thinking about. The uh, ability to study uh, uh, both anatomy and neurophysiology, uh, both in animal models as well as in humans, has led to the development of a plethora of computational techniques that have been exci very exciting and particularly successful. Here I'm showing a family of different so-called convolutional neural networks, which are uh, all the rage these days in AI, and have helped us solve uh, a, a large number of problems from detecting breast tumors uh, much better than clinicians do, all the way to discovering uh, new planets. Despite the success of these 
these uh, type of networks. There are many problems that these networks still cannot solve. So here's one simple problem, the ability, the enormous ability that humans have to make inferences uh, from partial information. This is Piazza San Marco uh, in, in, in Venice. And despite the fact that you probably have never seen before uh, uh, any tables floating in the water, uh, you probably have no problem recognizing some of these objects from just a few pixels of information. So you can recognize what they are, uh, despite the fact that they may be heavily occluded in a completely strange context um, uh, and so on. So what happens in the human brain that allows us to make this uh, uh, inference uh, and, and, and understand the whole from just uh, uh, a few uh, small parts? So what you're seeing here again is the intracranial field potential in, in, in one of these electrodes. Uh, and, and looking at uh, when the patients are looking at pictures that are heavily occluded, so there's minimal visibility, and yet one can recognize what those uh, uh, objects are. The signals in the human brain, uh, in the human visual cortex, remain very selective, and they show a delay of about 50 milliseconds or so, which inspire us to think about what are the kind of computations that happen that allows us to solve this problem of inference or pattern uh, completion. So here's behavioral data. So here's how well humans can recognize uh, all of these objects as a function of the amount of visibility. As you move to the left in this diagram, you have less and less visibility. The problem becomes harder and harder. So this is state-of-the-art uh, uh, AI techniques to do visual recognition. These are the techniques that are having extremely successful. And here are uh, more. There's plenty of networks that, that, that have been developed to, the, to solve problems of pattern completion. And they still underperform with respect to humans in this very uh, simple uh, task. So what we did here was uh, based on uh, what we understand about physiology and anatomy of the, uh, uh, of, of the cortex in, in, in humans, uh, we implemented what are called recurrent computations. That is, we added the specific types of connections inspired directly by the biology. And what this does is essentially bring the representation of the occluded objects closer and closer to the whole ones. Each circle here corresponds to a different object. The full circles here are partial objects. And you're changing the representation here by using these type of uh, recurring connections. And by doing that, we can build AI systems uh, that outperform many of the existing ones just by taking inspiration from, uh, from, from the brain. So in the same vein that we can use biology and neuroscience to help inspire better AI, we can also be, be, uh, use AI and state-of-the-art AI uh, to uh, help us understand brains better and to help us uh, solve problems about brains. So here's one of the uh, questions that we recently tackled. Imagine that you're studying the activity of a neuron and you want to understand what the neuron does. In the context of visual processing, the question is posed as, what kind of images will trigger firing in that neuron? What kind of uh, uh, pictures the neuron will be excited about? And this is a very challenging problem. Even if you have a, a 100 by 100 pixel uh, image, each pixel with 256 uh, uh, shades of gray, uh, the number of possible images is uh, uh, astronomical. At the rate in which we do typical experiments, it would take about 10 to the 14 centuries to exhaustively sample the entire stimulus space to discover what that neuron does. So what uh, a talented student did was use uh, state-of-the-art techniques to generate uh, uh, images. So I told you about these convolutional neural networks. They take images. They extract features in order to do pattern recognition. We can invert the process and start with features to try to generate uh, uh, images. So what he did was develop an algorithm that will take a generative network, that is, it will generate and create pictures, and will use the neuron uh, to decide what kind of pictures it likes and what it, uh, what it doesn't like. So the neuron is telling us in real time what kind of pictures uh, are, are, are particularly good at, at, at driving it. And here's an example of how that works. So what you're looking at here is the evolution of the neuronal preferences, not over the course of the 10 to the 14 centuries, but over the course of one hour, where we can discover and have the neuron dictate what kind of preferences uh, they are. So this is the particular uh, picture that drove this, uh, this neuron the best. Here's another example going from the first generation, we start completely with noise, and within the course of one hour, we don't have to wait 10 to 14 centuries, we can discover what the neuron actually prefers by using state-of-the-art uh, uh, techniques in artificial intelligence. We heard a lot about music. We heard beautiful presentations uh, 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 yesterday. And uh, one of the big challenges in understanding their brain function and also fixing brain function is that uh, many of us don't believe that uh, brain function depends on the activity of a single neuron or a single uh, brain area. Uh, it, it takes a village. So it goes from uh, understanding uh, what a, a single person does to, as uh, Todd described, uh, an, an entire orchestra, an entire group of people uh, that, that get together. And that's 
how I think about the brain. I think about the brain as uh, uh, multiple brain circuits that are somehow working together, and that adds uh, to enormously to the, to, to the complexity of the problem. So one of the things that we're doing by virtue of the fact that we can simultaneously interrogate multiple parts of the brain, we can build uh, a brain machine interfaces that have electrodes uh, in, in many different places. We're beginning to elucidate uh, the, the flow of information from one place to another. And I'm not going to have time to say much about that now, but uh, uh, feel pre free to ask me uh, uh, later. But I think that this idea of uh, understanding the, the whole village of, uh, of the neural network and how different uh, parts of the brain connect to each other and talk to each other will be a fundamental uh, uh, challenge and a fundamental aspect of understanding cognition as well as fixing uh, cognition. So in terms of uh, communication, the type of visual signals that I was uh, uh, alluding to uh, is conveyed to many places in the brain. And one of the main targets uh, of the visual system uh, is the memory system, uh, in particular the medial temporal lobe. So here you're seeing a diagram that this, uh, seems very complex, uh, but it's actually an oversimplification of the architecture of the primate visual system, starting with the retina at the very bottom. And at the pinnacle of this system is HC, the hippocampus, uh, uh, which is part of the medial temporal lobe. And many of you probably know about the hippocampus uh, by uh, virtue of this uh, famous patient HM. If you don't have um, a hippocampus, bilateral excision of the hippocampus uh, leads to a profound uh, uh, loss of the ability to form uh, new memories. The hippocampus is also the main area uh, that shows uh, severe deterioration in Alzheimer's disease as well as many other forms of uh, dementia. So what happens uh, in the human uh, medial temporal lobe when you actually interrogate the activity of uh, uh, individual uh, neurons? So we think that the medial temporal lobe is uh, playing a fundamental role in filtering information and, and transforming this uh, basic sensory input uh, into our uh, uh, abstract uh, uh, recollections and, 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 and memories uh, uh, of, of what happened uh, in the world. So here's one example uh, neuron that responded in a pretty abstract way to three different pictures of former Bill, uh, President uh, uh, Bill Clinton. So this is not a neuron that responds to just uh, any face or any uh, uh, random uh, 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 shape, or uh, uh, it, it's, it's extremely specific, and it's also invariant to many of the features uh, that actually compose uh, that, uh, that, that particular uh, image. So we think that this is part of the process that begins to filter information and extract the kind of abstract notions that our, our, co our cognition is uh, uh, representing to form uh, new memories. One of the main challenges in understanding uh, memory formation is that we forget mo most of what happens uh, uh, in, our, uh, in our lives. Uh, so somehow there has to be uh, a a system that will extract uh, and dis dic uh, dictaminate what's uh, relevant and what's not, and will somehow uh, discriminate and filter out information uh, to decide what's going to be stored and what's not going to be stored. There has to be some way of defining events and defin defining boundaries uh, between events. So this is very uh, recent work uh, that, that we're starting to do now, looking at uh, individual neurons such as this one, uh, who seem to be able to demarcate different uh, uh, events. So these are, uh, again, uh, patients with epilepsy, this is a recording from a neuron in this, an area called the parahippocampal gyrus. And while the patients are watching a movie, this neuron seem to be, seems to be demarcating events and deciding which particular events uh, will form part of uh, our episodic memories and which ones uh, will essentially be uh, discarded. So I told you just a, a few glimpses of uh, what happens uh, in, in, inside the brain. Uh, we are at the verge of a, a, a revolution. Uh, the emergence of uh, novel neurotechnologies, such as the ones that Ed Boyd and many others uh, are, are developing, uh, are allowing us to uh, interrogate and, 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 and interact with brains uh, in an unprecedented fashion. And married with the enormous power uh, of, of artificial intelligence, this opens the doors uh, for uh, really uh, dreaming big and, and, and thinking about ways in which we can build brain machine interfaces uh, that can uh, um, alleviate disorders, as I, as I already alluded to at the beginning, maybe potentially one day even also uh, uh, augmentate uh, human cognition. So I'll stop there.